Dr. Rachna Garg. Dr. Rachna uh, is also an institute graduate of the same batch. Uh, she went on to do MD radiology at the institute. And then she has been, uh, she has opened her own center in Greater Noida. And she is a specialist in women and fetal imaging uh, uh, and a member of the International Society of Ultrasound in Ops and Gyne. Uh, she's a, uh, she is a life member of the Society of Fetal Medicine, and she has her own center called the Dr. Rachna's Diagnostic Center in Greater Noida. We are also privileged to have with us Dr. Shikha Gupta, and uh, Shikha, is, has, uh, Shikha also did MBBS in the same batch, and she went on to do MB in Opsen Gynec from the Institute again. And uh, she also left the Institute to open uh, to uh, have, her, have her own practice, and she's at the Neelam Hospital in Rajpura in Punjab. So over to you, Deepta, and then we'll go on to listen to Rachna and then Shikha, and then we'll come back to have some discussions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Aditi. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Deepta Ghatayan. As Aditi said, I'm an ophthalmologist. I'm currently an associate professor at the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha. I'm also the Glaucoma Fellowship Director. I spend half my time in research and the other half in clinic and in my educator role. I'm married to Sachin Kedar. He's a 1992 batch Amazonian. We met at Ames, got married in residency. He's a professor at the same university, and we have an 11-year-old daughter. We live in a truly horrendous time, but it allows us to connect with friends again that we haven't seen for a while. I could not have survived the crucible that is Ames MBBS without Rachna and Shikha. They're the smartest and funniest women I know and have carved luminous paths for themselves in their lives. I'm proud to call myself their friend. I left Ames in 2004. You can take the girl out of Ames, but you really can't take the Amazonian out of the girl. One of the first things Ames teaches us is how to impart gyan to others. I actually remember marking Aditi's anatomy textbook when she came in. We always started with Snell's anatomy first, and then we moved on to Chaurasia just before the exam. I don't know if you guys still do that. It's really nice to connect with Aditi again after more than 15 years. So I normally talk on glaucoma, but today I was asked to give a talk based on the lean in philosophy. Lean in, which is the Bible of all working women, is a book written by Cheryl Sandberg. We all know her as the chief operating officer of Facebook, one of the most powerful women in the world. I admire her greatly. The first chapter of her book is titled The Leadership Ambition Gap. What would you do if you were not afraid? And here is where I'm going to diverge a little bit from Cheryl. Now, this applies to both men and women. But the question as I see it is not how far can you go, but how far do you want to go? For me, I don't want to be chair of my department. I don't want that leadership role. It seems to be an annoying role, full of a lot of administrative boredom, but other people do, and I appreciate them for it. What I want to do is my clinic. I want to do my research, and I want to lead my lab, and that is okay. Everyone does not need to be president or chief operating officer or director. Your sky can be set at a very different height than someone else's sky. What is important is what Cheryl Sandberg said. What would you do if you were not afraid? It's important that you reach for your goals without fear. Today's talk will outline some of my life experiences on that. The first rule of work, be good at your job become indispensable to your organization. You've got to work hard, got to read the books, read your papers, read the literature, show up on time, be accountable for your mistakes. Simple, right? Advocate for your patients. And especially when you're just starting out, say yes to people for the jobs that no one else wants to do. When there are committees you'd rather not be on, or if someone has a nasty call or holiday call, say yes. But above all, don't whine. Life is hard. Medicine is hard. We know. Save the whining for your best friends. Don't whine at work. Just don't. This applies equally to the intern and to the professor. If you aren't good at your job, no one will respect you. And then leaning in without respect 
It's just a waste of time. If you're good at your job, then you also need to know your worth and insist on it. That means before you ask for anything, make sure that ask is fair and then give evidence for it. Once a month for deadlines or for talks like this one, but weekends are for family. That means papers get delayed. Maybe a grant goes in later, but I have accepted that price. Find out what your balance is between happiness at work and at home. That means your goalposts may shift occasionally. But sacrificing work for home or home for work does not lead to happiness. In fact, the word sacrifice is silly. If you think something is a sacrifice, don't do it, at least not long term. What you need is boundaries and priorities. The about talk exists so you can find this work-life balance eventually that leads to happiness in your life. Well, my email is deeptaghate at gmail.com. I am on Facebook and I'm always happy to answer any queries that anyone may have. That's all I have today. Aditi? Thanks, Deepa. I was just trying to unmute myself. Okay. Right, Thank right. you so much. That was a very nice and uh, uh, full of examples talk on how to uh, walk the talk of how Cheryl has outlined the uh, topics. Uh, uh, we are happy to take even more informal discussions around this, but um, mm -hmm. I think I would just give it over to Rachna. And how has uh, life after MBBS been for her? And any uh, points for undergraduates? Taking your own uh, life examples taking forward. Over to you, Rachna. Thank you. Thank you, Aditi. Hi, good morning. I'm uh, Rachna Garg. I'm 95 batch MBBS. I'm a radiologist and I have a small diagnostic center in Greater Noida. Lovely to hear from you, Deepta. Your thoughts do resonate with mine when it comes to work-life balance. Uh, so Aditi had asked me to share a few words about my personal background. Well, uh, I was born and brought up in a small town called Kapurthala in Punjab. My father has retired from a government job and mom is a housewife. I'm married to my batchmate, Harpreet. He is an ENT surgeon and we are happily settled in Greater Noida for the past 13 years. I have two daughters, uh, elder one is 15 and the younger is 11 year old. So uh, my sojourn at AIMS spanned for a long uh, 12 years, right from 1995 when I joined MBBS uh, till February 2007 after finishing senior residency in general radiology. So although I've been asked to share my experience of life after AIMS, but since this is an informal interaction with the undergraduates, I'm really tempted to share a few things about my life at AIMS, especially the, during the internship period. The internship period, as you would all agree, is the decisive part of your career. I, we try to weigh the options for the future. There are a lot of uncertainties. We feel lost many a times. I remember my first posting was obstetrics and gynecology. And a new form doctor in myself, I worked with full enthusiasm. We did mini labs and I even assisted cesarean sections with the team of very dedicated senior residents. I started enjoying it so much that mentally I thought I considered my career, but the patient came with an obstructed labor. While the health providers tried and tried, they couldn't do anything. I was just a mute spectator in the whole, uh, whole, the entire episode and it ended up in a great deal of disappointment. So I was shattered then and then I decided, no, obstetrics is not my cup of tea. So this is how the decisions keep on changing uh, with time, especially during internship. So I decided to take up a non-surgical branch and we started preparing for USMLE. I cleared step one. And while I was preparing for step two, this PG entrance happened. So casually, uh, we appeared for the exam. And I'm, as if all is predestined, both me and Harpreet, we surprisingly got good ranks. Suddenly, the entire thing got, I mean, the, the plans were all changed. We were the only doctors in our family. The sentiments in the family really rose high. Our parents wanted us to stay back. And out of the blue, nationalism prevailed. And it was an over, <laughs> overnight decision. We sa said, okay, now we are quitting the uh, MLE thing and now let's uh, stay here. So I got the radiology seat. I got married to Harpreet. We worked very hard and started enjoying the residency. 
as you know the radiology department at aims is certainly one of the best in the country and i had the privilege to work with the stalwarts like dr manorma bari dr uh, seema mukhopadhyay we had dr arun kumar dr ashu seth so i completed 3 years of junior residency followed by senior residency with full commitment am i audible yeah yeah, yeah. we can hear you okay okay so uh, we decided to hold on to aims forever uh, we wanted to take our faculty uh, positions over there but it seemed feasible also because towards the end of senior residency i think this was around 2006 end of 2006 several posts for faculty seats were supposed to be announced but as luck would have it there were some reservation issues some court orders and an indefinite stay on the faculty seats and the entire career plan came to a standstill now what we never had any plan b we were not prepared for this so here i actually want to emphasize that one should always have an alternate plan in life this goes a long way in preventing so much agony and dilemmas so we thought about two options either to stay in the institute as research associates god knows till for, for how long or to take a plunge into the private healthcare system we were completely unexposed to the private setup it was i was like a frog in the well you know very naive with very little exposure to life outside aims because i was 30 years by that time 17 years of your life you 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 are studying and the next 12 years you know you are at aims to be honest i remember that at the institute we had been really prejudiced against the private practitioners we used to think them as money minting souls with very little academic interest nevertheless we thought about exploring the private sector i was quite confident that with the vast ocean of knowledge acquired during several years of the institute a decorated resume we would be welcome with open arms but <laughs> our perception was deceived i applied at various corporate hospitals and diagnostic centers but with mixed response now the illusion of that celebrated amazonian was dissolving into the harsh realities of private sector i was unemployed despite spending years at the institute that certainly was disturbing unlike my friends in various iits where they get conveniently placed even my sister from iit iims they got placed through campus placements into uh, various multinational companies and we little mortals were completely left on our own at that age we realized that we were well trained to become good doctors but we were not trained to be good negotiators there was a paradigm shift from the institute to the private sector so there's another issue which we faced this is regarding the metropolitan cities like delhi there is an incumbency in the job position in delhi ncr the cost of living was so high there were not many co- corporate hospitals but this field was flooded with pass outs from various medical colleges here there was an ever increasing number of dnb pass outs then there were diploma holders and you had to compete with everybody for a job here i would like to mention that in retrospect i do regret of not having done a fellowship after post graduation which seemed the need of an hour if you want to survive in mega cities i believe that the best time of doing a fellowship is after a junior residency when your family commitments are fewer and it is relatively easy to go to other cities or countries to get some ace up your sleeves for that extra edge so ultimately after much deliberation we decided to move on to greater noida that was around mid 2007 and i i took up a job in a small corporate hospital there So Greater Noida at that time was a new, well-organized, quiet and clean uh, city in the suburbs of Delhi. There was very little traffic, and the life was peaceful. It was inexpensive also. So we rented a lavish three-bedroom apartment in a European-style, nice society, paying paying a small rent of six thousand bucks. I remember. So my initial, uh, uh, I remember my initial days of financial struggle. You know, at that time when we were SR, the six-pay commission had was not advice so we used to get a very small stipend uh, during our senior residency and absolutely no savings at all so when we arrived in greater noida we had a truck full of cartons of books and hardly any furniture we slept <laughs> on the floor for 6 months believe me so my first paycheck from the hospital arrived around 3 months later uh, i mean uh, after the date of joining probably it's their way to prevent attrition so that the doctor doesn't run away oh. so i remember one very funny episode a senior manager from the hospital admin said Uh, that she would like to come to a place for a cup of tea i said okay but i realized i didn't have a formal sitting place in my house so me and harpreet we went to the market to buy a small sofa set on emis so <laughs> although most of the yeah most of the imaging modalities were there in our hospital over there but being a female radiologist i was offered more of a women imaging and fetal imaging i must admit then uh, that in our radiology curriculum at aims 
I had very negligible exposure to fetal imaging. We never did obstetric ultrasounds. I had to learn a new skill set all over again. So I read up a lot, attended conferences, seminars, and actually started enjoying fetal medicine and imaging. So we do miss on certain things like interventions and angiographies, which we do at AIMS, but then we acquire new skills. So these are just trade-offs. We don't regret them once we make informed decisions. So, and then uh, we, I did this job for two, three years, but then corporate hospitals have their own issues. After working for a few years, I decided to move on and have an independent practice. Only ultrasounds can give you that independence in radiology, especially if you don't have a financial corpus. But the question that bothered me at that time was, how can an AIMS pass out settle in not so glorified role of a sonologist? Mm -hmm. At the institute, I remember, ultrasound never got the respect it deserved by us, the residents. We used to run after CTs, MRIs, interventions. The tag of a sonologist appeared a little lowly. But with the encouragement of my mentor, Dr. Ashok Khurana, who's practicing sonology in a defense colony, I decided to pursue it wholeheartedly. I realized that there is a vast scope in this modality, not only in women and reproductive imaging, but also musculoskeletal, pediatric imaging. And nowadays with high-end equipment, you, you can do a whole lot of things. So it's a very evolving and gratifying branch of radiology. So another issue was setting up your own practice in a tier two city, which has its own challenges. You know, most of us have very little insight into the business aspect. Finances involved in buying a machine, acquiring a clinic space, various uh, important approvals from the government agencies. Most important aspect, however, was to establish yourself in a field which was largely infiltrated by so-called doctors or quacks in small towns. Mm. The ethics and virtues which had been inculcated in our curriculum at AIMS did not allow me to have a commission-based or cut-based or referral-based practice, as they call it, which was a norm everywhere in this town, in this country, in fact. In the initial days of my struggle, I realized that private sector tries to average out all. You have to carve a niche for yourself. It may take some time and patience. They say that it takes 1,000 days of a dedicated effort to build your own practice. I had to learn the ABC of private practice, that is availability, behavior, and competence. Be accessible, be compassionate and kind to your patients, update yourself, acquire new skills, be good, and as Deepta said, be indispensable. I think that is the key. Besides, if you're self-employed, you are your own boss. You can set your own limits and standards. Nowadays, the concept of good practice has offered many challenges. I mean, it, uh, it has many advantages. You can take bigger steps, you can split the cost of establishment and do a whole lot of things. But I agree, it's not easy to find like-minded people with the same frequency and approach. And I feel that one should always team up with someone who has similar or better skills than you so that the learning continues. The Greater, no uh, Greater Noida, where I practice, has a mixed rural and urban population. You see very closely the gender inequality, lack of proper education for marginalized women, and a strong preference for male uh, child. All is so closely knit in our social fabric. So being a woman practitioner, this has given me the opportunity to connect with these women and gain their trust. I believe that I'm doing my part in providing quality and accessible healthcare at the grassroots level, and I'm really satisfied with this. So one thing I really miss here is that since we are a small community of Amazonian, a batch of 50-odd students and a few PG colleagues, most of which uh, settle outside India, you really feel the lack of social connect with like-minded people. You feel lonely at the top especially if you are in a small city. In contrast, if we see most of the medical colleges in India, and especially in the state where I work, usually they have large batches of 300, 400 students. The doctors passing out are interspersed all over the state and country. We have seen them all bonding so well. I wish more people from Institute were around in the private healthcare system of India. Well, I would like to end my talk with a few practical recommendations from my experience and my mistakes. As you know, a radiologist would always put that in the, at the end of the report. So please correlate individually. So ensure that you have some savings at the end of residency. It will save you from a lot of struggles. Go learn some financial management skills. Earning money is good, but managing what you earn is very important. Always have an alternate plan B ready during your residency at AIMS. Consider working in India. Be an entrepreneur. Make your own rules, your new ideas of business models. Follow your ethics. Be prepared that being in private setup, you will not get much help from government or society. But still, it is very very gratifying and it will make a sea difference in the healthcare system of the India. 
ultimately stay easy stay cool life is a celebration lean in grab every opportunity to be happy as my spiritual guru says do your karma, karma with honesty live your life with satya sadachar and sadvyavhar yash apyash man hani sab vidhi ke haath move on charai vit charai vit enjoy thank you rachna for those excellent excellent summary, summary of uh, how your life experiences have taught you and i think it was very 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 uh, well uh, put out uh, we we could all relate to all this i'm sorry for the kids in the background so the fact yeah, that that looks lovely that's, yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's understandable i'm sure mm. so all right so i, I mean uh, uh, we'll come back to you rachna again but uh, uh, we are all waiting to hear from shikha and we'll come back the three of you again hi yeah. shikha hi over to you so hi good morning everyone and uh, let's go congratulate the young brigade and giving this opportunity shikha we uh, i'm not sure if others can hear you clearly yeah, but i think not, there's a problem yeah. with the voice we need your uh, you to be closer to your laptop yeah. or the voice yeah. to be louder okay can feel a bit can you hear yes we can hear but uh, it's it's still not as loud and clear as the others Use earphone, Shikha, if you have earphone or some Bluetooth. We, we're just louder than Shikha to start with, so. <laughs> so I'm very bad. So it's a relative so thing. My son just yeah. picked it up, so now I have to just sit across the table <laughs> and start chatting. Well, uh, my life has been quite a little different from uh, what my friends have had since uh, I joined the private practice of my in-laws, which was already there. So that way, I had I would. say little less of struggle well uh, as someone rightly said that you will not live long enough to figure it out for yourself everything so it is and why waste time and energy when you can learn from others who have gone the same way so by arranging this series of talks i think every one of us would learn from others experiences and uh, move on so i'll uh, give a brief intro i am 1995 batch same as rachna and deepta and uh, aims is like a mini india so we see people from all states all sections of uh, society each one coming here for higher education well our batch was little different we had lot of punjabis and that's the state i belong to uh, my parents are doctors and uh, my mother was a private practitioner in option gynae i think that is partly the reason i chose this field later on uh, five years of mbbs in aims was like a picnic i remember fondly everything we did there starting from wrecking then rec room parties and uh, pulse academics was i don't think that important you used to study last day for forensic exam because no one would open their books till the last day so yes i have very fond memories of our uh, undergraduate days and then i joined as a uh, jrship in obstetrics and gynae in the same department under the wonderful unit of dr deka and uh, dr meena where again we had lot of free hand to do what we wanted to do uh, late night surgeries no one would question you anything and that's what you want in a surgical branch so yes that gave me a good experience on personal front i got married when i was in final year of my uh, md and i had met my fiance only once and that's the day of our engagement and uh, next time we met we were married we stayed together for a week and he went back because he was in his final year of ms general surgery at kmc manipal while i resumed my final year at uh, aims both of us were busy with our thesis and then exams so we hardly got to see each other i finished in december and after four to five days uh, break i joined senior residency while my husband Uh, cleared his mch in urology and he went over to lucknow sdpgi again the life was same work work all the time i would do duties four to five weeks continuously including sundays so that i could get a three day break and fly over to lucknow to uh, be with him but sa ship in aims is what i felt was little different from people who graduate from aims versus sa from outside in terms of the number of hours you are made to work the uh, kind of duties you were put through any complicated case comes any vip comes you are made to do bedside duties also sometimes the leave would get cancelled at uh, the last moment i remember once i had just landed in lucknow and got a call to come back because something had happened at the department 
and that that was it it just broke me down and i resigned at that time without even thinking what i'm going to do next so i shifted with all my luggage to the another hostel in lucknow that is sbpj i i thought i'll enjoy my life for some time because i've been at least for last three and a half to four years during the pg time had been working continuously where we would have a shift of 30 hours and with only two hours break in between twice a week and gynae posting was very uh, really uh, hectic so i joined the genetics department in a pgi as a non dm fellow it was great fun i would work for 3 to 4 hours in the opd and rest of the times i was enjoying my uh, role as a homemaker trying to maintain my home trying my hand at cooking which i was pathetic but <laughs> two three months later it all sounded very unexciting i think that's what aims does to you you cannot simply uh, stay still so i yeah. left that and then i joined a private ivf center that again was as a doctor as a on a personal front that was my first exposure to a private center and also to ivf because at my time there was uh, no ivf facility at aims and that was that i found very academically stimulating there i worked for some time then i went to calcutta to do fellowship in ivf and finally i came back to the uh, place where i got married that is rajpura i'm sure most of you have not heard of this small town this is a non district town around 20 25 kilometers from uh, chandigarh and uh, even being from punjab and this place being close to chandigarh i had also not been there ever in my life so when i shifted everyone was little uh, taken aback because most of our batchmates had shifted to us and uh, those who had stayed back in india were mostly settled in bigger cities especially delhi so i left big city and uh, left aims and went back to a small town called rajpura where my in-laws had a 30 bedded decently run option gynae practice where basic work was being done so i joined there in 2005 that was 15 years back and with the time we kept on adding uh, newer things into often gynae practice fetal medicine then ivf and later on my husband also left his job of assistant professorship at pj chandigarh and he also joined us so uh, now we have a 150 bedded hospital multi speciality hospital where i work as a consultant more so at spinal level because that i have been doing for so many years and as an administrator as well because uh, that being a new portfolio takes a lot of my mental energy and involvement. Now, if I and uh, personally, I am a proud mother of two children. My daughter is Sara is 14 years old and has interest in medicine, thankfully. My son, Rehan, is 11 years and wants to be a cricketer. Let's see what happens. <laughs> uh, so, if I look back at my 40 years, 42 years of life, so every decade has has different challenges and there have been certain principles which I also did not realize till I thought back which have guided me. First and most important what I feel is you have to be decisive. You have to make up your mind what you want. I think our mind is uh, very fickle. It plays games with us. So do not give it too many options. Take your time. Decide on what you want in your life. Visualize your life how it would be if you get what you have thought of. And then if you like it, then work towards it. There will be failures, but we have to persist. So the persistence is the goal without, uh, without worrying about the failures in our life. Well, working in AIMS versus working in a private practice is a totally different ball game. AIMS gives you a lot of protection in terms of a lot of backups. You have every kind of staff, you have colleagues, you have seniors, then uh, any kind of diagnostics you want, any kind of medication, you don't have to think. You don't have to think about the consents. It is just implied. I remember if a patient had to be shifted for a cesarean, we would not explain anything and we just tell the relative to sign and get blood. Then financially also, AIMS does not teach you how, to, how you have to counsel the patient regarding the uh, financial aspect, because in private, as Rachana said, everyone 
looks at you with a negative sense in the sense that you are probably here to make money, which is not so. Mm. Especially when you come from AIMS, I think few things that it teaches you. One is we do not get baffled. We are seeing so many cases, maybe not in numbers, but in the variety of cases you see when you are studying here, the kind of complications you have seen. So nothing really scares you, at least when you are on your own. Secondly, it teaches you to be ethical. Third, importance of keeping up to date. I used to remember while we were studying in uh, MBBS, we go to library in the last few days and I would always think once I finish my exam, I am not going to enter into <laughs> library and study. And we would see our consultants, our HODs studying and we would feel wonder why they are studying. <laughs> and now when I'm studying, I keep one hour daily to read and my children are like, Mama, why are you studying? You are 40 years. Please leave it. Don't study. So I think that's what AIMS does to you. You feel have the compulsion to keep yourself up to date. You want to know what is happening. In private practice, there were few handicaps, but we work diligently towards it. And now I enjoy the perks. I would call it perks that it gives you instant gratification. Because you treat someone and you feel good that yes, you have done something good. Secondly, there is no red tapeism. You want something, you want to acquire a new equipment for your facility, you want to buy something. There is no file work, no, uh, there is no delay. You want something, you find that it is good, you can just order and have it. Thirdly, you can have a flexibility of work schedule. Being a female doctor, it becomes all the more important because you have to balance your personal and professional life. You have, have to take leaves when you're expecting, then you have to rear up your children, you have to attend their PT and study in Patiala, which is around 40 minutes. You have to attend their, all their PTMs also. But in private practice, it can arrange my appointments in that way that no one suffers and I can have my life. So the bottom line is, line is you have to enjoy what you do. You have to create the environment where you want to work because nothing would be served to you on a platter. You have to take advantage of the opportunities, take advantage of what you have learned and put it to good use. Thank you. I put in few slides. I don't know. Aditi, can I put it? Yeah, sure. Please go ahead. Uh, you'll have to share your screen. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, someone disabled. Yes, Oops. How are you supposed to? Uh, There's some questions on the chat, Aditi. So. Yeah. Yeah, I'll come to them. I also have a few of my own. Yeah. <laughs> Just, uh, are you able to share screen or not? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's great. Oh, nice. I oh, oh nice. <laughs> uh -huh. so this is our hostel day. Oh, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to point them yeah. out, right? There were six girls in a batch, you know, four of us. There's, are, there's uh, Uma. <laughs> yeah, Uma in addition to that That's lovely. <laughs> yeah. oh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, there was Aj Ajita. All sleepy souls, huh? <laughs> Ajita, Uma, and who was the same? Moitri, Moitri. Moitri, of course. Moitri. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she is. <laughs> it's awesome. Shimla Yeah, this is uh, getting the degree, and uh, this is my husband. This is Manipal. And this is my Calcutta pictures where I did digest. And uh, this is my daughter. This is our first, <laughs> first hospital where I joined. This is our new hospital. Wow. And Wow. Oh, nice. And uh, this uh, last picture is from Amazonian get together, which we had in Chandigarh in December. So, all the Amazonians of uh, North, especially Chandigarh and uh, Punjab, got together. It was great fun. Okay. That's it. Oh, that's Very awesome. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you, Shikha, <laughs> for those throwback pictures. Uh, before we get started, I would just li like to. Uh, 
let our participants know who are listening to these speakers that as easy and as chilled out these girls might sound to you, they were the toppers of, of their batch and they were very, very excellent academically. All three of them we have looked up to uh, throughout our undergraduate year. So they'll have fun and they'll, they'll just make it big at the exams. So, I mean, uh, as humble as they have been, I mean, uh, Chika hasn't told you her rank and uh, Rachna hasn't told you her PG entrance rank. Rachna, what was your PG entrance rank? We had our reservations intact, the Aditi, so I think that, that's, that's something you which... You don't want our ranks. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. But I think but we she, were the lucky she, last batch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so another thing that Cheryl Sandberg does actually say is that all we women attribute it to our luck, what, what our hard work is actually. But it's all right. I mean, we are not going that way too much. Mm. Uh, essentially, they, they are good. Uh, they are they have had a good, uh, they have balanced their lives very beautifully and they have uh, managed to work and have fun and have a good family life as well. And, and there are just so many lessons here in their small talks here today that I don't know where to begin. So uh, <laughs> beginning with a small question to you, Deepa. Uh, why did you choose ophthalmology? So... So I, I was one of the few people who I've always wanted to do ophthalmology. So when when you come to uh, MBBS, I think people want to be neurosurgeons or cardiac surgeons. I wanted to be an ophthalmologist, uh, primarily because I've always worn glasses, and that was the only branch that I I kind of knew, and uh, I had a big interest in physics and. Uh, I don't know how many non-ophthalmologists know this, but there's a lot of physics involved in ophthalmology. The shape of the eye and optics play a huge role in every single thing we do, especially in glaucoma. If I do a laser, the shape of the iris changes as soon as I do the laser. That's that's kind of cool to me. <laughs> so so, And I remember in my seventh semester, I actually saw a cataract surgery. I was like, this is, this is really cool. This is what I want to do. So, so, yeah. I wanted a field which would combine medicine and surgery. ENT was the other specialty that I was considering. And I still like the E and the N part. It's the part with all the phlegm which which is pretty gross so 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 that that i did not like so. <laughs> okay but uh, 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 many of us many of us like rachna you are we we have uh, sailed through internship uh, very confused from one specialty to the other uh, okay so uh, what what since all three of you did manage to do your residency at aims before you moved out uh, some of you have highlighted some lacunae in our training, such as not exposing us too much to patient uh, counseling related matters, uh, having not taught us to have a life outside of your studies, that is financial aspects, managing practicalities of handling a business and other things. What other, uh, per se, in the academic, academic framework or in the surgical aspects or other things, do you think that the Institute residency programs lack? and could be done better. See, how, how much time do you have? So, so oh. yeah. We have time. You finished in time. No, so. Just kidding. <laughs> so, uh, uh, personally, I felt uh, the biggest uh, lacunae was that uh, ultimately I had to choose a speciality more uh, like obstetrics and uh, uh, gynecology imaging and which we had zero exposure at AIMS. We never used to do any fetal ultrasounds and all. And that is my forte now. So that was the biggest lacuna. Now they've started doing it, but I don't know why we were not exposed to obstetric ultrasound at that time. Oh and also, as Shikha rightly pointed <laughs> out, uh, the, the counseling part, spending time with the patient, listening to the patient, and the set of ailments that you see in the private uh, setup are way different from what you actually see at AIMS. Although it prepares you to face the difficult uh, question, the difficult patients and all, uh, all the rough challenges, like I am practicing on an individual uh, basis, so I, I don't feel scared of uh, any tough challenge or case and all. That's the training of AIMS, like as Shikha said. 
but the basic uh, ailments like i remember harpreet used to say i don't know the name of any cough syrup when i when he passed out from aims he said it's difficult to actually prescribe a cough syrup despite being an ent because they never saw such cases you know cough cold and all which are like 60 70% of your main practice the allergies and all the spectrum of patients that you see when you are in private uh, is very different we have to count the number of stones the size of stones in the kidneys which we never did at aims we thought it's so so insignificant but here the, all that patient wants is very different expectations from you when you are here in private practice yeah. so shikha would tell us why why ops ultrasounds are still with obstetricians and not with radiologists because <laughs> okay. so the story which went around was hod gynae had a big tussle with hod radiology yeah yeah <laughs> yes. i also heard that story yes <laughs> So, so, so they had that women fight, you know, <laughs> and we were the sufferers. <laughs> But we, so. uh, uh, we had that advantage. I learned all my scanning at AIMS. I did not need to do any uh, this thing mm. after I completed my residency. So we were well versed with ultrasounds during our PRC. Mm. So uh. that's the advantage we learned. <laughs> so uh, okay so uh, let's take up a few questions on the chat here so there's one question from our student it's m student arushi to rachna uh, she's asking rachna you took up fetal medicine a relatively new skill after 12 years of learning radiology how scared were you to take this leap of faith it did drive home the point that one is never too old or skilled or knowledgeable to learn more yeah hi arushi uh, it's mainly the fetal imaging part not the fetal medicine so i don't uh, do any uh, prescription thing but yes uh, it was initially it was very challenging but uh, it's been very gradual the transition has been very gradual over the years and so you learn new things and you know ra- uh, the ultrasounds and uh, radiology also evolves with time so the key is to ta- uh, keep yourself updated i mean the learning should never stop so it it becomes a smooth ride it's not tough you you learn new skills so and it's the fun part of practicing otherwise there will be a lot of monotony so. okay uh okay bhavik has a question to you uh, as well i think this is quite this question is more to shikha actually what difference exactly are you referring to in terms of work and life of an amazonian or external senior resident in aims uh why do you believe such a difference exists and should it i don't know because uh i would uh, my shg was under dr sunesh who is a very very hard task master as compared to what impression we have of him as undergrads and of being very nice so what would happen is the number of like there is a grand round you are question for every patient even though it, that patient is doesn't belong to you you are supposed to know each and everything about the ward you are supposed to call up every consultant about any thing which is happening any complication you are called back from hostel i remember one of her fellows had done a prolapse surgery and she had a wall prolapse at night i was sleeping after the, doing my duty and i was called back you come back and do it now and there is no Uh, appreciation that's what you crave for at least you have worked <laughs> your ass off small mistake you make and you are humiliated but that's what i would feel and uh, you do something good that is what you are supposed to do so yeah. that's what i was so, not into so you actually face the disadvantage of being exceptionally good huh i don't know no. <laughs> i was not Th- this is life, i think because uh, no, but so this is so exactly so what I waited for six months. I thought he will appear for AIMS exam, so I lingered on till June. And he was very clear; he wanted to stay in SDPGI. So I thought one of us had to let go because we had been married for one and a half years and had met only thrice or four times. So I remember first time I went back after marriage, he was supposed to pick me up from the airport. I was looking, uh, looking at our wedding picture. I was thinking maybe I've forgotten his the uh, face. <laughs> And he said, "I'm. I'll be carrying a bouquet of flowers so that you can recognize me." That was my flight. So, I just wanted to live so, my own life. I had stopped enjoying my. You know what? Do you remember Shikha for your wedding? I I got leave, and uh, my leave, too. I also leave got cancelled, and I could not make it to Shikha's wedding, and for a ridiculous reason, for for no reason at all. It was not a pleasant time. 
I mean, I my I had a good time in my MBBS, but but my residency was not pleasant. So well, and my I, experience is different. Yeah, uh, radiology yeah. department was pretty cool. I mean, it was yeah. nice. <laughs> <laughs> so we never had that. such issues. Yeah, but, but that time was not very good. <laughs> but but what were, but I must say what was good are the people I met there. My first SRs were R P Singh and Vinay Garodia. They they taught me by example. They were SRs just like Shikha was an SR, right? They faced the same pressures that the SRs faced, but they were ethical. They were knowledgeable. They taught us stuff, you know. In throughout my residency, I did not have a single surgery that a faculty member stood next to me and assisted me in. the senior resident was the person who assisted me now when i would not i'm faculty now every resident is they are my patients right i assist a resident on every procedure that they do i'm not going to let a resident go in so that's training in the us versus india there was a difference it wasn't nice and it could be very different now i want to emphasize that this was 20 years ago and the residents now tell me much has changed and things are far far better so this is not the case anymore but uh, yeah there were wonderful people but there were not such wonderful people too okay uh, i i would say the big issue was there wasn't any uh, standardization so you you didn't have to leave with so many surgeries done so many things done here i here the resident has to sign out of things if they are in a glaucoma rotation they need these many lasers these many surgeries 15 of these procedures done before they graduate and it is my responsibility to make sure that resident has it that wasn't there it was entirely the the resident's job to to get surgeries and surgeries were given as a favor in a surgical field which is not the way it should be i think the so case it, load the workload at aims uh, is very much so i think the, that yes, is something yes it was uh, very high there were 10 hours uh, running and uh, but it could have been better so the, yeah it seems there's a lot of lot of scope to change what Uh, happens here through residency so undergraduates moving forward you have a tougher task ahead so they are happy with the, the mbbs training and all that went with it but not so happy about how the mb trainings went on and there's a lot to learn for the current mb programs as well okay we'll move on to uh, move on to another uh, comment actually from dr vinay garoria and he he writes work is often given to those those whom the seniors trust more and i think this is pertaining to perhaps dr mm-hmm. chikha's comment i suppose i'm not sure the department trust they train people more so aims graduates and post graduates are made to work more and in the process they learn more as well the advantage and disadvantage of being good and sincere yeah that's yeah. true I, i i agree with that sentiment and uh, i think at that moment it might seem that you are not being commended for what good you do and you're only being blasted at for the things that you don't do right that's because the expectations that ride on your shoulders are uh, that that come with the job of being an aims graduate become far more i guess uh okay so questions from the audience to all three of you actually uh, any 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 books that you would recommend reading because uh, outside of the curriculum of course uh, deepta your facebook posts apparently reflect your love for books i'm sorry i'm not really active on facebook and i don't follow any yeah. of your devas you and other no. stuff So go ahead, go ahead with you, so, Deepa, first, and then the others. Well, the the book that I've recently recommended to everyone is Less by author Sean Greer. It's a Pulitzer Prize winner, and the funniest book I've read in a while, and it 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 makes life better. Everyone should go ahead and read it. The other book that I have recently, an author that I was recently introduced to about six or seven months ago, I don't know where I missed it, is Tana French. and she writes mysteries and they beautiful mysteries and into the wood is uh, which is one of her books and it's really fun too so so it starts as a mystery but then delves into something much deeper so those are two books which which i've enjoyed recently and 
brothers. Yeah. Yeah. Sita, do you get time to read at all? <laughs> read a lot. I can't read without reading. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Last time I was not able to see because I had an afternoon nap and then open a book at the call. So, right. One book I, I remember which uh, influenced my mind while I was, read, I was attending was Maidenhead by Ryan I read it twice, thrice. I don't know what got into me, but I was so influenced by her. So that is one book I was reading. Presently, I am reading uh, uh, Becoming by Michelle Obama, and I find it quite interesting. It's nice. you, you know what's interesting about Michelle Obama is uh, she she left work after her husband became president, which yeah. was, uh, yeah. she did. You know who did not leave work, just incidentally, Jill Biden. <laughs> Oh, okay. she, she is a college graduate professor, a PhD, and uh, mm -hmm. she kept working even as second lady, just FYI. So, uh, so, so, so I'll, take, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll take, take that thread up to ask a couple of questions here, which I'm curious about. So mm -hmm. you said you always wanted to do ophthalmology and not so much mm -hmm. ENT because of the P, P of it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. what was Sachin's reason to take up ophthalmology? Was it ophthalmology? So Sachin, incidentally, no, he he's three years senior to me. So, so uh, I mean, you were together from, from uh, right, you know, right. Yeah. So uh, Sachin uh, was uh, kind of going the route Rachna was going. So he was giving his MLEs and gave the exams and matched into ophthalmology. Oh. So while giving his US MLEs, he started his residency, and he really enjoyed it. And he, then I was at Ames and uh, he never went. And then he stayed, he finished his uh, MD. He did his SR ship. And there, you know, just what Rachna and Kocha faced uh, <laughs> four years down the line, there was a roadblock. What next? Mm -hmm. You know, so we wanted to stay in academics. And that's when he came for a neuro fellowship to uh, the U.S., and I came for lab work in the U.S. And we kind of, we always thought we'd go back, but that didn't work out. So, uh, so you know, planning's overrated is what I tell everyone. But yeah, that's how it worked out. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So uh, moving on to, I don't think Shalimar is on the chat, Priyank, but uh, you would have loved to hear his reflections on the uh -huh. Uh, Shalima is one who stayed back. I don't know if right. there are many other. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you know of other batchmates that are at the institute or have stayed That's back? It's no, just I him. think Shalima is the it's only just one. Him, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's just him, right? He's our only connection. Yeah. <laughs> there are many uh, in NCR, not in Delhi itself, but uh, yeah, in Gurgaon uh, mm. and in Noida and others. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Okay, so um, so uh, one of our, uh, I think, current fourth semester students, Mehek Arora, has asked this question. Do you think that a little portion of the internship period be spent in the private sector just to facilitate an easier transition later, just in case? Uh, Shikha, Rachna, you'd probably be mm -hmm. more appropriate to... So I, I can maybe answer this from a, a US perspective. So our residents who do, who know what they want to do, for example, in cosmetic surgery, so they want to do LASIK or, or go into a sector which is more private than academics, do get time to spend in the private sector if they want. So they rotate with our private ophthalmologists within this town, they get two months to spend there. And they learn billing very early. In the second year itself, they learn how to bill. Because insurance is a big thing in the U.S., so it's a it's a huge thing. We teach our residents how to function in an outside environment, and they can go. I mean, uh, you don't need to do a fellowship or a SR ship at all. They they get enough surgeries, enough training in their undergraduate that they can go straight into practice, and many many do. And they often spend two months or one month of their residency with private practitioners it helps it helps a lot i completely agree with deepta i think if one is pre-decided yes what they want 
then uh, it's it will save a lot of time lot of years uh, together because uh, i have seen people from many other medical colleges who are very sure like uh, if they are doing md they want to go straight away into private practice so they can do those targeted type of uh, courses rather than uh, you know uh, rather than senior residency for that matter because uh, i think uh, doing other things which i'm not currently using and probably i've forgotten in the last 15 years so uh, instead of that if i had done something which is re- really related to what i do presently that would have been great and uh, at internship level only if you're that clear in your thoughts that you want to enter into private practice if a little exposure of a month or so is there so that can be of great help because ultimately internship is all about exposure to different fields and learning your skills and learning about yourself what you actually want to do in future and uh, setting up in, going to a university academic versus private these are all very very different um, setups so one should have an exposure i believe that was i think quite decisive in that sense remember uh, on my first day of uh, joining the, the ragging time itself i had said that i plan to go into private practice right so right i had decided on day one that is what i have in my mind so that's what i, I think i am one of the few people in our batch who did not even appear for mle i was so clear yeah. that i want to stay in india i will do private practice i will do gyne to rest of i think uh, ent was in your mind shikha little little bit ent little bit <laughs> everybody was wanting to have ent and harpreet was actually very very <laughs> scared <laughs> that was i had a huge crush on dr tucker at that time uh, <laughs> <my God>. okay <laughs> no no so in case, case you are not aware this is all on youtube and i'm sure we'll send dr krilling <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the the talk is really informal now <laughs> it's good that way yeah okay so uh, okay so i mean uh, what about uh, what about uh, you you think i mean it seems to me that both deepa and shikha were quite clear what they wanted to do during their uh, uh, their uh, residency and beyond uh, rachna obviously had a hard time just mm-hmm. as many of us have also experienced going around uh, making these decisions so how was it uh, the transition from aims to outside the outside world was very very tough on the two of you and uh, uh, we haven't heard from harpreet today but could you just generally briefly summarize a bit about him also so that the students of amelia mm-hmm. will struggle as well just in a couple of lines with me Yeah. I asked him I to join but he said yeah. he wouldn't. Yeah. Oh, uh, I would love to see him if he's around. Yeah, yeah, because I wanted him to have a first hand. Maybe uh, you can take up some other question and I can ask yeah. him to join. Yeah. Yeah. First hand experience. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 So we we'll take up another another yeah. question as well. Okay. So, uh, we have someone asking Bhavik asking you, would you advise Amesonians to continue till senior residency in Ames? is the extra work important for the exposure you need i i i wouldn't know right now what they think things have changed a lot in uh, in uh, rp center they 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 are given far more surgeries than we are in their in their md so uh, i i don't know the answer to that so i don't have that much contact with them so in my time it was kind of necessary you couldn't go straight into practice from from md but things have changed substantially so what about you Shia? what do you think what, what i feel is uh, it is important because once you have done your post graduation you are still doing lot of things and there is now is the time for super specialization mm-hmm. right i chose the field of medicine and i know which was not there at aims so best is not to waste your time doing what you have been doing in jaship if after jaship you can go into a spe- specified unit where you want to work in the future the kind the field where you want to excel in for example in gyne you have the options of fetal medicine you have ivf you have laparoscopic surgeries that would be nice that that is instead of rotating throughout after jaship you can choose one particular part and do your senior residency there that would be excellent that was not there at our time it was an extension of what we were doing in jaship other than uh, more independence you could make your own decisions 
and uh, the work wise that, that was not much different so at our time assessorship was not really necessary if you had to go into private hi yeah. coacher hi how are you great hi deepa so i was watching this whole talk all way long uh, but um, i just didn't come because uh, ladies are having a lot of time i'm not sharing <laughs> <laughs> we will welcome you anyway so <laughs> hi coacher this hi. is aditi hi hi so just tell us in a very brief nutshell how your exposure has been at aims and beyond what would you have changed about your ent residency okay so uh, uh basically uh, aims taught me some basic skills about surgery and how to hone them properly um what i ended up doing was just like this and I ended up doing a entirely different field altogether i was i am more into otology rheumatology and uh, very less into uh, into oncology which i was practicing at aims although i've kept my skills uh, still uh, sharp for those disciplines so that over a period of time i don't lose them at all um in medical practice also there was not much exposure at aims uh, so we didn't learn Uh, disciplines of infection and allergies, which I picked up uh, in private practice. So again, it was almost something very new for me. Uh, okay. At AIMS, uh, the biggest problem with us was that uh, we were under the radar of a particular uh, uh, thesis guide. So uh, all of the work was centered primarily based on the thesis. And uh, you see, my whole uh, uh, five, three years of junior residency and. and the uh, years of senior residency i was not rotated by my chief he said you are not going to go and so my exposure to other units was hardly any so but in practice i have done uh, hardly any ci surgery my whole my whole thesis was on cochlear implants but in practice i didn't have that uh, uh, equipment i didn't have that facility with me so i ended up doing very less of what i learned at aims so one is that the rotation through different departments is not uh, proper it's only on the whims uh, whims of the particular person under whom you are working and in senior residency it was all giving dates and counseling patients and working them up for surgery and in surgery making the making the ot go round and round i've done uh, complete senior residency at aims and what i've realized is i've just been a good manager it so i have learned the managing skills in the last in the senior residency and i have learned basic surgical skills in junior residency i remember when i came into practice uh, you would know that ent would do uh, tonsils adenoids and septoplasty as a basic bread and butter surgery and it aims we were uh, doing tonsil like me numbers like 1 and 1/2 2 and 1/2 because mm-hmm. after you have removed one tonsil the other person would come and say yaar dusre mujhe nikal yeah thyroidic was also na you you remove one thyroid and the other person says yaar usko to mujhe nikal so we were like at in cochlear implant it was a big thing when you were give, given a closure at uh, third year senior residency i was given closure of surgeries and then um, uh, my colleagues were used to say tu to chha gaya tune to aaj implant band kar diya and like mm-hmm. yeah, now now at least things have changed people are doing surgeries in um, uh, and way earlier than what we used to experience in this is what i said about standardization of surgeries it's not there everyone before graduating needs so many tonsillectomies so many adenoidectomies those things are are were just not there so so it was yeah, i would also like to uh, add in that research part was uh, uh, lagging uh, i remember that my, when i completed my thesis biostatistics uh, uh, I, i didn't know anything about it we used to go to biostats department and we used to wander in the corridors like uh, like a person in the forest ke darwaze pe khad khad aaye aur kis se kya research karaye like then we got spss 10 there was a software aur apne aap hi kuch kuch karke usse nikal ke pakda diya aapko thesis khol ke dekhega to usko plagiarism hi dal dega ki so who's ever is watching please don't open my thesis and so it's there in bb dikshit somewhere so so yeah So the research was uh, not tackled very well by us, but our general clubs were good. Our uh, uh, our uh, conferences were good. I, I must agree. So AIMS, uh, see, uh, it is far better than any other any other ENT department anywhere else in India. But in India, but if you are doing fellowship of even two years under a good mentor, even in India or abroad, 
Now, people have been trained abroad and they're coming back and setting up their own practice. So even if you end up doing a good fellowship, you are better than us in those disciplines. We don't mm. stand a chance to be with you. So that is what we were uh, trying to convey that um, if you want to do uh, something good, you focus yourself uh, early and uh, just focus into that speciality of your domain and then start off from there. So for seniors, then see the only advantage you would get is uh, the uh, the faculty position would be easier because you've done a uh, training job. But uh, in many departments, I don't think it will add to your surgical acumen. It, it, it will not. I think uh, uh, any training program would have its flaws and its uh, good prop good points. Uh, I also feel that personally, I feel that probably three years is not enough to experience a department. At least six years is required, and at least in uh, and maybe the times have also changed since when you trained. But at least I think there's an effort that's being made to rotate students through different units to get them to get a sense of what goes on everywhere, even during senior residency. Uh, we, if you want to end up specializing in something, I think you need to move even beyond senior residency to be able to get the hang of things and get into the depth or the level that you need to need to attain. And that's what probably fellowships here or abroad or elsewhere would offer you the opportunity to get to know better what students you really need to know. So, for example, I, I don't think three years of junior residency and senior residency in pediatrics is even enough for you to make up your mind about uh, what you are really good at within pediatrics. So I probably got into pediatric nephrology during senior residency. And then, I mean, I, I think I still continue to learn. So I think there's a lot going on that you uh, you it's an inefficient process all in all it, for the number of years that you spend doing these uh, trainings you probably don't get as much out of it as you would expect the training should have provided you say vis-a-vis -vis compared to other kinds of fields for example engineering or management or other education systems where you get a hang of things and exposure and Experience would have pretty well to but, but Aditi, in many other, like like at least in ophthalmology, most fellowships in the US are just one year, mm -hmm. as opposed to three years of senior SNC in India. So I yeah. did just a year of glaucoma, uh, retinized two years, but an oculoplastics, but everything else is just one year. Cornea is one year. And uh, your mentors make sure you get enough surgical skill in that year. So as fellowship director, I have to certify that this person is trained in doing it. And honestly, it's enough. Our fellows are well-trained because that's all they do in that one year, right? So, so I mean, I don't know if, if we had a shorter degree of senior residency in Ames, we could first take more people. Deepta, I think you muted yourself. Deepta, can't hear you. Deepta, we can't hear you. Oh. <laughs> I guess that's it. And then you're done, you know. Yeah. Rather than do everything as a senior resident as well. So, whereas oncology, I mean, I don't know how much do you do specialized oncology in practice now, Shikhar. So, and you were with Dr. Sunesh and you were doing a fair bit then, right? So. I totally agree with you. Uh, uh, women also, I want, want to add that our biological clock and a career clock is going uh, simultaneously. I mean, you are all senior residency. You have a family to look after, and then again you do a junior residency after two years, go to a different country. I mean, it, it is not practically feasible. I once thought, like after passing out from SSH, when we didn't get into the faculty position and all, we thought of doing a senior residency, but my daughter was one year old. So all these things do come up, and you have to make choices. So I thought three years period of senior residency is something which, yeah. uh, which, is not, which is not necessary, I would say, if you want to go into a different setup apart from AIMS or any other uh, uh, faculty post. For example, I'll, I'll just give you an example of our department, how things are different uh, for us, is that uh, we uh, we have a system of speciality senior residency. So what we have here is that uh, instead of doing this general senior residency, if you're rather clear of what you want to do, you put in your, uh, put in your specialty choice right at the beginning of the joining as a senior resident, and you are assigned that choice as soon as feasible. You get to do 
back alone for the next one, one and a half years. So we try to make space for that kind of a system. And I don't know whether RPC has a system like that, that ophthalmology has a system like that or not, or Oxygeny or, or radiology has a system like that anymore or not. But, but for example, even in radiology, we're beginning to have pediatric radiology uh, as a separate thing and, you know, other things. So I think times are changing and people are trying to adapt these senior residency programs in, at the institute uh, into systems that allow people to explore these choices without getting into precise fellowships or DMs. In pediatrics mm -hmm. alone, we have quite a few DM specialties now. So while you're preparing for those entrances, you can get a hang of the specialty by getting that specialty posting as a senior resident. So I think there are ways to rectify and people are working on those systems and hopefully things would change. It may change more for certain specialities and less for others. Right. And uh, yeah, yeah. Rachna brought up a very important point of uh, being women and having certain difficulties in your career. And uh, I'm sure others would have some things to say on the same as well. So do you think that uh, the gender forced you to make certain career choice or restrained you from getting more out of your career? than you could have done. So do, do you want to go ahead? So well, I would say it came uh, to me as an advantage uh, because in my field of imaging, I mean, I told you once I wanted to become an obstetrician. So I had an inclination towards uh, that thing, which probably I didn't, uh, it didn't surface during my uh, radiology uh, tenure at Ames. So once I uh, I was gradually moving into this uh, realm of women imaging and fetal imaging, and actually I started enjoying it. I mean, uh, that actually came as an added advantage. So as far as I'm concerned personally, I don't think I had to make uh, many compromises, but yes, small little things like uh, to begin, I had a practice in a commercial setup. I used to be very late uh, for, uh, for coming home. So I had to, because there was security concerns, so I had to close that clinic and then move to my residence-based clinic. So uh, all these uh, small things were there, but uh, I mean, nothing prevented me from taking giant leaps. Uh, but yes, I could have considered doing a fellowship after my senior residency, which is something I, because I had already completed my senior residency, but I uh, didn't do that uh, because of the yeah, family things, obviously. You make choices. I mean, you don't want to be away from your one-year-old baby for some time. So all these things are important. It huh? all boils, boils down to what kind of family support you have. In mm -hmm. my case, I never faced, you must have seen the last picture, I have a joint family. So now also in these corona times, my kids are with my in-laws. So they are staying with their grandparents and we are staying alone with no responsibilities. So that has come to my rescue. It has never prevented me from uh, doing my job, going uh, out to do my fellowship then uh, attending conferences, because I know there is someone to take care of my children. Had I been alone in a place like Rachna's place, I might have had some difficulties or say Deepta, they are managing on their own, but I never had to face that because uh, there was someone to look after my children. So. so I, so I'm going to say no in terms of choice, just, because I, we face life as a team, Sachin and I. So if we make a choice, we make a choice together. So he would face the same limitations that I would face. If he go to a city, it would have to work the best for both of us. Let me give you an example. Immediately after my residency in the US, we, we, we had a choice of where to go and uh, we had a choice of a couple of universities where we interviewed where they needed a glaucoma specialist and a neuro-ophthalmologist. So one of them, Emory University, was best for Sachin. The other one, it was where his mentors were. It was where he was trained. It was excellent. And all of these had given us job offers. Another one, Case Western at Cleveland, was probably best for me. Their chairman was a glaucoma specialist. He was brand new. He wanted to expand into fluorophotometry, which is the branch of research that I specialize in. Nebraska was probably second best for both of us, but that's the one we chose because Emory was terrible for me at that point of time and Case was terrible for him. 
So this is something else. So maybe both of us compromised, right? But it happened. The one thing I will say that I have faced as a woman is what Sheryl Sandberg calls the likability trap. And this is somehow more so maybe in the US than, than in India. It might be there in India, but I did not work in India beyond a trainee role that women are expected to be nice and they're expected to to be likable and uh, if you if you have objections to things that are going wrong those things in a man are considered uh, considered taking charge whereas in a woman it's just considered being a bitch so so that's been a bit of an issue nothing terrible nothing to overcome but it has to be done as a team and you and your partner have to be a team in this so, so it's there you i mean gender issues are there everywhere in the world they they're there but you just got to face them so rachna kochar would you have something to add to that uh, actually and not for this particular topic i think uh, rachna has made a point i just wanted to come back to the previous uh, topic regarding transition from uh, uh, private pra- institutional to private practice uh, there are two things uh, which i would like to point firstly um, it is uh, it is not uh, uh, it is illegal to practice outside while you are working at aims um, completely understood but then there is a informal uh, idea that many uh, medical colleges in delhi they allow their senior resident in the last six months they uh, decrease their amount of duties and they would ask them to venture out and to practice and just have a feel of what they wish to do after completed their senior residency if the people have made up their mind to practice outside they would at least uh, have a kind of a buffering period in which they would have transitioned from their institute to the private, private arena this doesn't happen at aims the more, the more senior you get your burden with more duties at aims so the moment you are uh, out of the senior residency immediately you are hit hard you, you have to Uh, negotiate you have to create a corpus for practice as a surgical discipline i i would need lakhs and lakhs of rupees just to have my own instruments to work otherwise i am becoming a bot in the hands of the corporate management you do as we say and if you don't work as we say uh, make up your own setup but i don't have my money for my own setup so that transition part into practice is not there and that would that would make us very frustrated uh, somehow uh, somehow uh, for us that buffering period was a bit uh, restricted uh, as rashna said uh, we were sleeping on the floor but we were spending all of our money on buying equipment so to, we wanted to settle down very fast so we were making a lot of compromises on the personal front uh, secondly regarding getting focused early in life see at aims we just don't want to give up our skills that is that is how we've been trained uh, in jayashri Uh, if there is a particular uh, uh, reach of your department, for example, in ENT, we would like to know otology, rhinology, laryngology, head and neck surgery, neurotology. There, there are so many facets to ENT, but we just don't want to give up one and focus uh, and uh, uh, pick up one and then defocus from other things. The problem with this is that uh, after you've completed your junior residency, if you just don't focus yourself fast. if you are going into corporate setup or even in otherwise uh, or tied to cities or close to metropolitans you just can't settle down fast because now people have got focused into their speciality and subspeciality so well that a person would get a referral only to a, a, a guy doing a particular domain uh, surgery um, uh, i think dr vinay is here and uh, he would uh, clearly understand my point that uh, he being into retina there is another person into oculoplasty although everyone is doing everything we know it but you need to focus into one domain very early which didn't happen in mm-hmm. so we, it hasn't been a norm to open it up to uh, participants to speak but uh, but uh, let's just uh, uh, take their questions from there i think i'll bring bring it back to the topic that we were discussing and uh, that's because i mean the points are well taken her brief but it's just that we need to rein in everything in the time span that we have uh shikha do you have anything to say did your gender determine any of the choices that you made or restrain you from doing more than you think that you could, you were capable of uh, i don't i don't uh, really think so uh, in fact it was the other way around because uh, once uh, uh, i had shifted from lucknow to rajpura and my husband uh, finished his ncat after that he had lot of options to 
settle in Delhi. And uh, but because I had already uh, settled in practice, it is because of me that he did not join anywhere else and chose to come back. So in fact, it was the other way around. So I have not faced that kind of issue. In fact, I will uh, like in uh, in our hospital while we are hiring. So we have a hiring person who looks after HR, and I would say there was a sense of discrimination against women employers. Like when we are hiring, a girl who comes for interview, the first thing they would ask is, "Are you planning a family?" And right. there was like uh, if there is a choice between two candidates, one is a boy and one is a girl, the preference would go to a boy. Uh, telling that this girl will uh, take maternity advantages, she'll be off, she will have family issues. So it was very uh, difficult to break that uh, mindset at our place. So yes, that bias is there, although I did not face it in my case. So, so, so what did you do to rectify it? Did you change that practice? See, uh, the uh, important is in India also, in India especially, uh, there are a lot of benefits given to mothers in terms of maternity benefits. So that comes under the regulations of government. So government pays for their nine months. In a private sector, you do not want, you cannot afford to spend. So if that part is taken care of for your employee, you are not hassled, you are not paying from your own pocket, then it is fine. So we made it a point that every employee gets a maternity, every girl gets a maternity. So now the choice is totally dependent upon the merit of the candidate. There is no gender bias. So one of, whoever fits the bill, who is more qualified, more experienced, gets a job instead of whether he's a boy or a girl. That's what we try to do. I, I, yeah. I can tell you when, when I was interviewing for faculty, for assistant professor, one of the universities I interviewed with, uh, they said, okay, we are we allow part time, so you can have another child if you want. This was something. <laughs> so why would I go part time if I had a child? But that was something they said as 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 a thing. And I, but no one ever said that to my husband, who was also interviewing in the same <laughs> university. They didn't tell him they could he could go part time if we had another child. So bias is there. I mean, we we're it's 2020, but it's I, I felt the bias uh, in uh, I felt the bias in the institute. In fact, when we were senior residents, totally. like once, uh, yeah, because uh, uh, because you know we are radiology is a radiation based field. So once you are pregnant, then you have to be off X rays and off CTs, mm -hmm. and you're given very light kind of a job, mostly uh, reporting X rays and all. So and uh, you you go on leave for six months. And there was, you know, internally amongst the senior residents, there was a lot of, uh, you know, uh, dissent. Like, I'll be pregnant, okay, now she'll go on leave. And and once you come back, you are just hounded with so many, so much work. Like, you were away from six months and now you're back, so you have to work like crazy. So, all these bias uh, was there. But in private, uh, fortunately, I didn't feel that. So everything came to an advantage. So, I think uh, inherently, uh, there these biases still prevail, right? I mean, uh, I'm sure there's a glass ceiling everywhere. There is a there is there is employment discrimination at a very subtle level, as you rightly pointed out. Say for contractual opportunities. Uh, so in my in my setup and that I'm hiring research staff, I try to do a reverse discrimination, which is as inappropriate, I'm sure. But but I think I I, I try to balance it out. But whatever. I mean, I think there are... But there that's are again a discrimination. Uh, that's discrimination, <laughs> right? No, my, my reasons are different. We, we, have, we, we, we tend to... Uh, I mean, you know, you very often have you have research jobs coming up and then you think about who will be stable and who would stay on and who would linger on and do this work sincerely. And then the demeanor and the attitudes of the people, the candidates, somehow it kind of uh, fits into favoring... Uh, women in that in those roles, but that's that's not that's not the, the gender doesn't really put that there. But let's let's get back to uh, get get back to the gender biases at the institute. Do you think uh, you felt any such reverse discrimination or pro discrimination or, or discrimination as an undergraduate as well uh, in your interaction with your faculty seniors 
or in your interactions with your peers do you feel that the gender came in between in your in these interactions yes of course i mean i i would say at least when we were there a baseline level of and this was not in aims it was in all of delhi there was a baseline level of misogyny in everything that we did you go on the dtc bus you go on this in the institute things that we would take for granted and now quite horrendous like tfs and other things you oh, know they, right. they, they were they were full of misogyny they were so nasty a lot of these things we just took it for granted because we did not know any better now i i would step up and and we would tell them people to shut up you know but we we didn't we just thought this was how life was supposed to be people are supposed to prod at us in dtc buses this is just what it is so we accepted it and it was it was rubbish and it was awful uh, a lot of it i mean when you were in the uh surgery department i was always the one asked to make tea when i was the intern when there was a, another intern who was always there but uh, that was just again we accepted it because we like this is this is how the world is we didn't know any better that's all we saw right so but but people who were older than us should have known better faculty who supervised those tfs and who sometimes sat as judges should have known better but they did not and if we didn't we were 17 we was we just racking was full of misogyny a lot of it you know so we just accepted it it's not there anymore i hear which is good but uh, but there was a it, this was again delhi in 1995 was a different place it was not pleasant for women you know we all know so but it was something we we just never went out at night alone we did this we, we if there was if i was going home and i was the last person on the bus i would get off at two stops before and walk i would never be the last person on the bus this is all internalized just systemic misogyny that's just there so we just Yes, I, I'm sure it is, but it's not true in other parts of the world. You know, it isn't. So, uh, in many parts of the world, it's just I would agree with Deepa. Yeah, she's yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. We just accepted it because we didn't know any better. But uh, it was it was everywhere. We just didn't know but any she, better. I think <laughs> I think it's very enlightening to remember and recall all that. Rashna, do you have any other examples to that you recall or remember, or do you think? Yeah. Well, personally, uh, no, but uh, I don't recall many Aditi, frankly. But uh, you know, I met Harpreet when I was in first year, uh, and uh, uh, I mean, I was always with him most of the time. So I <laughs> wouldn't say that personally I had any uh, problems like that. So, but I mean, but, but, but Deepa is right this, uh, yeah. as far as DTC and Delhi security at AIMS campus. I never felt uh, that. But but Rajna, Maybe. do you think? But do you think your being with Harpreet was the fact that made it different for you? Do you think? Yes, that it might were, be. It others were not. Be. Yes, so, I, I didn't get a chance to observe it, you know, through a different lens. Yeah. Do Do you remember when we were in MBBS? There was someone with in our batch or close to our batch at Mamsi. One of the medical students got raped while coming back from the library, and uh, the Mamsi. administration's response was to not allow women to go to the library after 9 pm that was their response yeah she Didn't she got the social media at that time you know no, right but all right. this was big then yeah. it was big yeah, yeah. It, it, was, it was never it made was big yeah yeah it was, fact, it was in the news all over there were protests right. but we never participated even as an institute right 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 mm-hmm. so it was it was just horrendous the whole thing so Pika, you seem to have a different take. Did you did you want to say uh, something? See, I never had. Uh, I was not privileged enough to have a company to work. Empty. <laughs> <laughs> I was all alone with my girls. But uh, the campus-wise, I never felt any insecurity or uh, anything like that. Obviously, once you are out of campus, that holds true even true even today. See, I have a fourteen-year-old daughter. I cannot imagine sending her alone uh, outside my home. un uh, unguarded or unaccompanied by someone so i think it's going from bad to worse this that is not improving that's all so yeah no. being reported more we are more aware of what is happening but it has been there and, and i don't think anything changing 
Okay. I think India is rated the worst uh, as uh, far as the security for women is concerned. So it's been there throughout. Oh, uh, let's yeah. Let's like step. Yeah. Let's step back. Yeah. Let's step back into uh, say a role for say a faculty member like me or somebody. How do we how do we change things to make it better for the women here as students as postgraduate students as senior residents as Co colleagues, what needs to change at least? I I don't think as a resident my issues were different. I don't think they were they were gender based, uh, honestly. So and I will give that to if if you worked hard, uh, it did not matter. And I did not have kids then, so I do. You know, my senior resident colleagues might have faced different issues. But uh, but that was there. I mean, they they treated uh, women. It was it was how hard you worked, as Shika said. If you worked harder, you got more work. And in surgical fields, we we appreciated that we got more surgeries in many cases. So, but uh, that was there in RPC. I did not have a gender based thing. I never faced any issues there. Uh, yeah. I'll come to another question that we had in mind. I mean, Chikha and Rachna, particularly to you, do you think that uh, you you could have gone abroad like most of your batchmates? And do you think that you made the wrong choice by staying back in the country? Chikha, I'm sure, is quite firm in nodding away. No, no. I'm very happy. In fact, uh, Aditi, I would. Yeah. Chikha, go ahead first. Then we'll take you know, this. I'm yeah. happy that my daughter also wants to go uh, for medicine, and uh, I hope that she joins our hospital. We'll have more working hands. So I have never regretted. Many of uh, my cousins are also doctors who are settled abroad, and uh, we keep hearing their uh, nice stories. We we had a Zoom session 15 days back uh, with our batchmates, and I was listening to what's happening uh, in US, and I do not regret my decision at all of staying back. Because I always want Especially to with COVID now. now. <laughs> so. I don't know. COVID is here equally bad. Uh, yeah. It is equally bad. <laughs> I never wanted to go abroad. I would go to roam around uh, as a tourist. I would go and attend a conference, maybe do some uh, fellowship or something. But I always wanted to settle in India. Rachna? Yeah, uh, see... Uh, uh, that this question actually uh, uh, haunts me many times. You know, you keep on thinking about it. What if uh, at that crossroad you had made this decision, then your trajectory would have been completely different than what it is here. So there are always uh, trade-offs, as I said. I mean, you win some, you lose some. Uh, winning part, I must say that I have enjoyed radiology, the work that I do, it is my passion. Probably I wouldn't have done that when I would have gone abroad because it was mostly internal medicine or some speciality of that. So, uh, and also her pre wouldn't have got a surgical branch. So both of us are really happy in that sense that we're enjoying the work that we're doing. Uh, we, there are issues with private sector related to politics and bureaucracy here and the treatment of doctors. So those things I wish could be taken care of in a better way. Those are the only regrets that I have in private practice. You are really on your own with no support from any social uh, setup. You're just paying your taxes and not getting anything in return. No social security, no financial security. Like in COVID times also, our clinic was closed. So you are working like daily wages and you have to pay your staff. But I mean, there is nothing that we get from the government or the system for this matter, which might be better, you know, better social security and financial otherwise. But uh, uh, staying in India, uh, uh, I don't think uh, I'm. I don't regret that. I, I really feel that everything happens for good. So I have gained so much and I have uh, made so much here. So I don't think uh, it's a regret. Deepta, would you want to? Would you? Would you, you said that you had always planned on coming back, but you never did. No. Uh, so I had planned on coming back. I always had for some reason. So. Uh, but I don't think it's going to happen now. This this year after, uh, so we've been eligible for citizenship for the last four years. And this year is the first we applied finally. I feel like my vote might make a difference in November. So, 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 uh, so I, 
I don't think I'm going to come back, which is sad, which, which makes me sad. And yes, I do miss India every single day. If life is easier in the US, but it's not the same. It really isn't. Uh, I, in a different life, I would have come back, but it's not this one. <laughs> so, yeah. But life happens and you got to, got to take it as it. Yeah, you got to. I mean, life is easy in the US. Don't don't get me wrong. It's it's much easier in many ways than than uh, than in India. But it's not not home. It never will be. So so. But it will be home for your kids. So they they grow up here. So it's a different thing. But people who have lived in India for for thirty years, US for 30, 40 years, it's it's still never home. It never is. So it's there. Pika and Rachna, do you, uh, uh, because because Deepta continues to be in a university program, so I'll, I'll keep her out of this, but do you, do you miss research or do you miss the uh, connect with academics while you are in private practice? Yeah, uh, first of all, there is uh, no disconnect with the academics when you're in private practice. I think that is a misconception. Private uh, practice, private uh, setup is around 70% of the healthcare. Uh, and we see now that a lot of research publications are coming from an organized private setup. Especially in uh, fetal imaging and all, I've seen most of the papers are from private setups. So uh, on my personal front, yes, I am not doing my research because it's an individual-based clinic. I have a certain set of data and I have uh, thought that I will, yes, uh, compile and I'll do, but that's a thing of future. Uh, but uh, we do miss, but otherwise saying that private, otherwise is a non-academic area, I wouldn't agree to that. Yeah. You can't really exactly survive in private practice if you are not uh, reading. You, you have to be ahead of others. Only then you can survive. And uh, yeah, that is true. But practically, it is not possible because you have, most of the times you are busy with your patient work, your administrative work. That leaves very little time for research. Well, uh, uh, at our hospital, we are starting DNB program from next year. So hopefully, that will uh, take care of that lacuna that I am facing. That I have a lot of data, same as Rachana said, but we are not able to compile it. Once we lost touch also, I do not remember any statistics and anything. So, but... Uh, we are not taught that way, actually. It becomes be difficult, even during senior residency. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I want to just say that academics in the U.S. is a little different from academics in India. I am still pretty much in a private practice setup. So, I get paid two sets of salaries, one a tiny bit from the College of Medicine and my majority bit is from my practice. So I eat what I can kill uh, over there. I, it's totally number of patients I see, number of surgeries I see, I make that money. Now my research, the 50% research I have is from a grant from the NIH. If I lose my grant, I have to do more private practice. Private practice. So I do more work. So I get a tiny stipend from the university for teaching, for my fellowship role, because I'm in the residency core program. But uh, the majority of my money, in fact, I would say 90% of my money is either from the NIH, which you have to earn and which will expire next year. So if I don't get a grant within the next year, about 90% of my money will come from, from just seeing patients, just like anyone else. So. Okay. And that varies every year. So if I see more patients one year, I make more money. It's 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 exactly like private practice in that way. So uh, Professor Sahani, you would recall from uh, gastro surgery, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Sir is asking us, asking you, do you think you would be? Uh, he's asking, I think Shikha or or Rachna, would you be willing to pay someone to look at your data, analyze it, and write it up for you? Yeah, <laughs> that's that's fascinating. You know, if there was an ophthalmologist with a lot of data, I would look at it. So if there's an interesting research question. So just, you know, I, I would. I, I have no problem in helping analyze data. I have a, 
I have a lot of help to do that. So, you know, reaching out to people in academics and this kind of partnership would be really fruitful if, 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 uh, that is agreed. Because in fact, Hartreet has actually hired out his data to somebody to do that research and all. He's paid somebody to take it out and do the research because he has all his data intact. In Even I have a lot of data. So it would be a wonderful idea. Yeah. yeah. What do you think, Chika? Would you, would you want your data to be looked at and analyzed by somebody? So we need a sector, organized sector. Statistician, yeah, like with that, us. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This would be a great AIMS yeah, private wonderful. practice partnership, yeah. uh, you know, thing. Hmm. Uh, we have one question that we didn't take up. That is by Priyank. He asked something back, actually. He wanted to understand whether there's any advice that you would want to give to your younger self 20 years back as an undergraduate. Everyone. <laughs> For me, I, I I would say just go to the U.S. earlier. So oh. <laughs> that, that would be my advice. Just go straight from MBBS. So, you know, so I, I did three years, Sachin did six years. I, you know, I had to retrain to be an ophthalmologist all over again. And they don't have that. Now there are different modes in which you can give your boards even without training. And I know many people who have done medicine in India and then gone abroad would give the same advice. So, so just, just go. Well, yeah. How about going abroad after your high school? Why not? Uh, why, why after? MBBS? Because because medical school was was great in Ames. It really was. Mm -hmm. What I learned in Ames, uh, the medical school here does not compare. It really doesn't. Mm -hmm. I would say I I I mean I work with medical students all the time, right? They are very, very focus-based and very evidence-based. Uh, they will know how to treat an MI and this, but they don't read. The amount of reading that we have done with Harrison's and everything else stood me in good stead when I did an internship, even after an ophthalmology residency. I still remember Robbins and everything I read. I remember Dr. Sani's lectures. So it, that, that, that was good. That was good stuff. So uh, it 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 made me what I am. So uh, what about you, Shikha? I don't know. <laughs> Any advice you want to give, or you think you did just fine? Was there anything that you'd want to change about how you went about the MBBS? Yes. There was a little unrest in my life, and I resigned from my associate. Oh, I joined one thing, then I jumped over to the other thing. So sometimes I would uh, regret leaving games without having any uh, future plans that I should have stayed back and done assessment. But as I told you, at that our times, there was no focus on your training in, uh, as far as super specialization uh, went. So you were doing the same work as the JRs were doing. So mostly the things have worked out fine. So really nothing much I can think of. Maybe little, little things, but nothing major. <laughs> Rachna? Yeah, I've told, I mean, I'm happy the way uh, things have gone for me, apart from the fact that uh, I would have done a fellowship after my DRship, uh, probably in uh, women imaging or pediatric imaging or whatever, instead of doing three years of uh, senior residency. I thought the, the three years of senior residency could have been better uh, used. So that's the only regret I have. Otherwise, DRship was uh, the post-graduation course uh, in radiology was excellent. So, uh, I don't have any complaints about that. So, yeah. Okay. That's nice. So, you know, you have uh, uh, Dr. Sani's question and your responses to those questions have excited a lot of uh, enthusiasm among the undergraduates. And don't be surprised <laughs> if you hear from them soon, asking That's for your true. data and offering yeah. to analyze them so that they get a bit and you get a bit data out and uh, you get a publication together. So that would be good, good work for them because especially as they are bored and they would, they are, you know, just itching to do some work. <laughs> okay, good. So uh, where's, uh, I suppose we have taken up all the questions and just uh, any open comments to each other? Do you think uh, you have any advice to give to each other? Hmm. 
I wouldn't have any advice yeah, for Shikhar. We meet, <laughs> yeah, we meet. They're amazing. So, so people you meet at AIMS are going to be the smartest people you will ever meet. So they, and I, I still, I still feel that. So, and that was good. They pushed you to a higher level, right? I mean, Shikhar and Rachita always did. They, they were so good that they pushed you up higher. They raised everyone's games just being in the same room as them. So. Well, awesome. There was a lot of competition. Shikha was my wingmate, <laughs> and I remember she, uh, we used to study till late at night, and we used to check on each other's light. Who is studying till what time? <laughs> <laughs> That's study last day. Right, right. A lot of tough competition at the yeah. Aditi, can I just pinch in with a comment? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Please, yeah. Harpreet, thank you so much for being there. Sorry, I couldn't say thank you to you. I you. see you are no. social distancing at home, both of you. So, yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what I say is that uh, what I miss most about my teachers is the kind of uh, life experience which they gave us. Um, more than the how I hold my scalper or, I, or uh, how I hold my forceps, I remember they imparted to us. So they made us uh, good human beings. We had such lovely teachers, Dr. Bahadur, Dr. Thakkar, Dr. Sharma. Um, even sometimes in my dreams, I'm working with them. So I loved them. I lived with them so much. I remember most of their teachings as uh, uh, as making me a good human being. Uh, uh, and of, of course, a surgeon. I was their student also. So I would want every teacher, every faculty at AIMS to uh, bond with their students, not only uh, as, as a teacher to a student, but as a master to a student, like teaching them about life also apart from the particular career skills. So uh, bond with them. Um, they, are those, they are in the formative years of their life. Whatever you will teach them, they'll invite. They are like sponges. They are naive. They, they want to know things outside their domain, out, outside their world. So while you are uh, with them for those six years of junior residency, senior residency, uh, just uh, dole out all of your experience into them, um, not only for the particular domain for which they are connected with you, like peeps for peeps, no, not for peeps, just your experiences in life and how they can become a better person outside of this. So uh, that's what we hope this endeavor is all about. And that's why we have connected with the students and made a group of people, which is students and faculty, uh, putting in their bits to try and uh, put together a series of talks, trying to bring in more than just academics into it. That's what this is all about. Thank you, Harpreet, for those inputs. Uh, uh, there's one question that's still left to be taken up. That's by a fourth semester student, Mehek, and Arshit, who's in sixth and is also seconding the same question. Do you think that a portion of the internship should be spent in the private sector to uh, make them help them make up their mind? What discipline would they set, spend it in? Internship yeah, is yeah, too I early, think you know. Yeah. Early days, right? yeah, yeah, too early, too early. Residency, yes. Internships probably too early, right? Too early. Yeah. They have to choose the discipline mainly. That that is important. Yeah. Uh, I would I would just request Mehek, could you unmute your mic? Maybe I didn't get your question right. Would you just unmute yourself and yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. So my question actually was, now that the international travel has been restricted and electives being very important for a residency in the US, how do you think the Indian students are going to cope up? A question to Dr. Deepta. So, uh, so electives, so I'm going to differ a tiny bit with this. I'm not certain it is as important as everyone makes it out to be, you know? Uh, electives are just part of the whole whole game. Now, if you are exceptional and you get a paper out during your elective or anything, it's fine. But so many students rotate through. Uh, it's difficult to remember their names sometimes. So, you know, what I would say is just CV is everything. We have to strengthen your CV, get good scores. What's going to be an issue is uh, visas, and we'll have to wait and see uh, what's going to happen now. There's a my husband's program director, and uh, there's a huge degree of uncertainty about the FMGs who are just starting. In fact, uh, my fellow, I don't know if Meghal's still on there, could not give uh, her step three. She matched into a glaucoma fellowship. She's an Amazonian because of COVID. So she could not, you know, 
complete her licensure requirements, she probably won't be able to, to start on time. So she has to start off cycle. It's a new world we're living in. It's a pandemic. Things will change, but electives are not going to happen for anyone, though. The other thing is even U.S. graduates cannot go on electives to other medical schools anymore. So someone at Nebraska cannot rotate outside Nebraska. So it's, it's going to be kind of an even playing field. The only people that they can see is each other now. So only our own students. But yeah, who knows? No one knows how this is going to play out. So I think uh, one last question. Uh, I don't think we have left anything uncovered. If, if there's anything of the questions from the last few questions now, really we are about to close. If there are any questions remaining to be taken up, please ask them again. I'm sorry if I missed your questions, participants. But I'll ask you one question. So uh, uh, this one's to Rachna, really. Rashna, you come from a family of illustrious, well, I mean, well accomplished uh, siblings, you know. I mean, uh, do you think that, uh, uh, would you, would, uh, I mean, you know, uh, elder sister, Bhavna Di, she mm. taught, she taught the IIM entrance and she was at IITK. IAS, and, yeah, civil services. Yeah. She, she, she taught the uh, civil services entrance. Of course, your younger one, Iti, did very well at the IIM entrance. And you remember a lot. You have a fantastic okay. memory, huh? Oh, God. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I, I was trying to remember your other sister, the youngest one's name. I, yeah. I, I'm sorry. I'm just missing missing on that. Mm, Mithali. Uh, yeah, Mithali. So, mm. I mean, do you regret making your choice of medicine given the struggles <laughs> you no. have, have so many years? Not at all. Not at all. In fact, uh, my parents feel that I'm the best placed amongst all of them. I mean, Aww. I'm the most relaxed and comfortable. Yeah. So I think I'm, there has to be a balance, you know, a uh, uh, home uh, life, uh, I mean, uh, the financial uh, things and uh, a very independent life. There are no bosses. So you, I make my own rules. I mean, they are really very happy and they would love to stay with me. And they always tell it publicly that Prachna is enjoying her life the most. I think that's okay. I think I get the best answer from them. I mean, IAS politicians, bureaucrats, they have their own set of issues. So there's a lot of stress in their lives, which I think I have managed my ways like this, that I'm quite stress-free and relaxed because I've always prioritized happiness as my goal of life. So I think that's okay. I'm happy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rachna. Thank you, Harpreet, as Thank well. You. For, Thank uh, you. Thank you, So session. nice. Uh, we, yeah. will, we will have some yeah. feedback organized around this talk. And uh, I oh. hope that the feedback form has been put up. If oh. one of the students could put it, put it up, that would be great. This is for the participants of the lecture. And we would love to hear from you what we could have done differently, what we should have taken up. And if there are any follow-through questions, we'll direct them to the uh, three speakers. Uh, on your behalf, and we'll take the feedback the next time. So, thank you oh, so much, Deepa, for you. joining us from across the world. Last, I last have to add time. one thing. If oh, I were a UG, I would have loved a session such as this. Yeah, so, thank you for yeah. organizing it for Dr. Sharon and, and you and everyone. It, this would have been so useful to us, right, when we were there. Yeah. So, so, so you're, you're already making the change that that you asked for. So thank you for doing that. So, yeah, there are lots thank of people you. behind it and I can't thank them all. There are so many of them that, that are making this happen. Thank you everybody for making it happen. But uh, most of all, I would like to thank our three speakers who came in on short notice with such a wonderful job of summarizing. I've jotted down the points. There were so many. I mean, they're just really nice points to go through life with. And we come back to you with if we have more questions. But most of all, thank you so much for being there. Shikha, uh, I can't Thank see you. you right now. Thank you so much. As well. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Aditi. Do, uh, participants, do please fill in the feedback. We would love to hear from you and see what we can do to make this better. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank Bye, Dita. Thank you, Dita. Bye. 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 Thank you, Dr. Sharon. It was a nice comment. Thank you. Bye, Mohit. Thanks. Goodbye.